wouldn't it be great if there were a way to encourage better manners in our kids without nagging or make them less likely to repeat unwanted behavior without harsh punishments? A strategy that would give you a plan for how to react to your child both in good times and bad. You're in luck, my friend. There's a basic concept from the field of behavioral psychology called operant conditioning theory that does all of that. The name sounds big and scary, but don't worry. I will make this super simple for you. By the end of this episode, you will be a pro and have a new parenting tool that I guarantee you will use every day. I love teaching parents about operant conditioning theory because this concept of shaping your child's behavior applies to so many aspects of parenting. I mean, everything from getting your child to sleep better to getting them to do their chores. Understanding how this theory applies to parenting can give you a huge leg up on promoting better behavior in your child and deterring unwanted behavior. That means a happier and healthier family dynamic and frankly, a more enjoyable and fulfilling parenting experience. It's truly a strategy that should be taught to every new parent. Let's begin by talking about consequences. Consequences are an essential component of positive discipline, the part that allows you to create a warm and loving household while ensuring that you provide the boundaries critical for successful child development. Consequences are the teaching or molding part of parenting that helps to ensure that your child will progress to where you want them to be when they reach important developmental child points of five years, 11 years, and 18 years. Teaching consequences entails balancing your long-term goal of friendship with your children with your parental role of a loving authority figure. It is important to establish that role of loving authority figure early. It's cute when your toddler climbs on you, but when your big kid climbs on you and you ask them to stop, you want them to listen. Consequences don't need to be harsh to work. You'll see this when we talk about manners and how some fun or silly tricks really do work. Consequences don't need to be big and scary and make you think of parenting as an unpleasant event or leave you feeling icky and having your child angry with you. There are times when real consequences are called for, but most of the time you can use consequences as a little reminder or in a fun way. Now let me introduce operant conditioning theory. It's time for a one minute history lesson to give you some context for where this strategy falls into the overall field of psychology and how it will inform your parenting practice. When we talk about consequences, we're talking about operant conditioning theory, which was developed by American psychologist B.F. Skinner in the mid 1900s. Skinner was focused on how people learn to act through their interactions with their own environment. For kids, it's primarily their interactions with their parents in their home environment that teaches them how to act. He was focused almost exclusively on observable behavior, so your child's actions, rather than internal events like thinking and emotion. I'm about to explain the four core elements of operant conditioning theory. Pretend that you're a high school student taking your first psychology class or a college student taking psychology 101 and learning all the fascinating elements of the human brain and human behavior. Once you have the basics down, I'll provide countless examples of how this applies directly to your parenting practice every day. This will change your life, so stick with me. Skinner introduced the terms reinforcement and punishment. Reinforcement means increasing the likelihood of a behavior by providing a favorable consequence that follows the behavior. So if your child does something and you respond favorably, they're more likely to do it again. Punishment refers to decreasing the likelihood of a behavior occurring again due to an unfavorable consequence that followed that behavior. So if your child does something and you respond unfavorably, they're less likely to do that again. If you've ever trained an animal like your family dog and think this sounds familiar, you're exactly right. Operating conditioning theory principles serve as the foundation of animal training. Kids are a little more dynamic, but the concepts hold true. Skinner introduced two qualifiers that apply to both reinforcement and punishment positive and negative. Now, Skinner's word choice here was a little tricky because he meant positive and negative to mean adding and subtracting. But most people think of positive and negative as good or bad. So when I teach parents about operant conditioning theory, I substitute more clear terms add on and take away. In sum, there are four key categories within operant conditioning. First, 
add on reinforcement. Here we are adding something good to increase the likelihood of a behavior being repeated in the future. Take away reinforcement. Here we're removing something bad to increase the likelihood of a behavior being repeated in the future. Third is add on punishment. Here we're adding something bad to decrease the likelihood of a behavior being repeated in the future. And finally, there's take away punishment. Here we're removing something good to decrease the likelihood of a behavior being repeated in the future. I know, it's a bit confusing. Don't worry, we're gonna discuss each of the four categories separately with very tangible examples, so it will make perfect sense momentarily. The critical thing to understand is that life has consequences, and for each of these four categories, they represent a different type of consequence. You can literally shape your child's behavior by understanding what type of response to use. This is very important because using the wrong response can actually promote them to have worse behavior. Let's dive into each of the four operant conditioning categories. First, add-on reinforcement. So as a reminder, add-on reinforcement means adding something pleasant to increase the likelihood of a behavior happening again. So that is you're adding something your child likes to promote better behavior. Here are five examples of add-on reinforcement applied to parenting. First, your child smiles, you smile back at them. Second, your child laughs, you smile and say, aren't you the cutest thing? Third, your child says a new word, you clap and say, you did a great job. Fourth, your child draws you a picture, you hug them and say, wow, thank you so much, I love it. And fifth, your child says they made a new friend at school. You give them a high five and say, that's so exciting, good job being outgoing. Each of these parental responses is naturally or intrinsically reinforcing to your child, meaning your child likes to see you smile, hear you laugh, receive praise from you, and get a high five from you. The positive feeling they have when you do these things makes them want to keep smiling and laughing and drawing you photos. So if you want to keep seeing these behaviors, keep reinforcing them. Remember, when we're talking about operant conditioning theory, we're discussing consequences or the environmental reactions to your child's behavior. Consequences don't need to have a negative connotation. The vast majority of your use of operant conditioning should be using add-on reinforcement. I'll briefly touch on four nuances of using add-on reinforcement in your parenting practice. First, honest praise. You can praise physical attributes to boost your child's self-image, choices like outfit selections, behaviors like kindness shown towards others, and accomplishments like new skills learned. But be sure to mean it when you praise your child. Don't overflatter. Not every picture has to be the best one you've ever seen. Your child is learning to trust that you support them, but also that you're honest with them. Second, accidental reinforcement. So another thing to be aware of is the possibility of accidentally reinforcing a behavior. I find that this comes up most with other people's kids. So if you ever see a friend's child do something totally rude or inappropriate yet adorably cute, like a teeny one talking back to their parents or mimicking inappropriate gestures or sulking or stomping or pouting, do your best to ignore the behavior. Turn away if you need to hide a smile. You don't want to accidentally reinforce that behavior by smiling and laughing because that might encourage them to repeat the behavior. It may be cute to you, but probably not to their parents. <laughs> Those behaviors can be adorable in a toddler, but are not adorable in big kids. So we want to teach them about appropriate behavior early. Third, goal behaviors. Be very conscientious about your use of add-on reinforcement for goal behaviors. This means focusing your praise on behaviors that you've targeted as major areas of improvement for your child. It also means maintaining praise beyond the initial accomplishment. So for example, if your child just learned to put their shoes on by themselves and you really want them to keep this new skill up, be sure to continue smiling, 
clapping, telling them how neat it is that they put on their own shoes now and how much you love to see them do it until that goal behavior is firmly established as part of their daily routine. If we celebrate the first time that they put their shoes on all by themselves and then we ignore our future efforts, we may find that they're no longer interested in putting their shoes on by themselves. If you've had success with this approach in your own parenting, I'd love to hear about it in the comments below. Next, let's talk about food as a reinforcer. So treats are commonly used as a reinforcer by parents. And I'll share with you an example. Somebody at Trader Joe's grocery store figured out a great scenario to help parents shopping with young children. For years, I packed a snack for my kids to help them through the grocery trip or we would make it part of the trip to pick out something like the biggest apple to snack on. But when we started shopping at Trader Joe's, we saw add-on reinforcement built into the shopping experience. If you've never been to a Trader Joe's before, I'll tell you that each store has a signature stuffed animal, like Wally the Walrus. And as you go down each aisle, you search for Wally because he moves every day. So this keeps kids entertained during the shopping trip and is a great idea. Then at checkout, when the kids are often at their limits, the clerk asks if you found Wally, and if you did, they'll offer you a free lollipop. Talk about a reinforcer for young children. And it keeps the little ones from eyeing all the treats that are typically placed right by the checkout area at grocery stores. Whether you shop at Trader Joe's or a different store, this is an example of using food as an add-on reinforcer that you could set up for your own child as a grocery shopping treat. Maybe if they're well behaved during the trip, they get to pick a decadent snack, or maybe you bring a lollipop and keep it in your purse until checkout. If you're comfortable using food as a reinforcer, let me tell you about another little trick that I loved using when my kids were little, but old enough to eat solid food safely. I would keep a few different flavors of Tic Tacs in the car and have each child's favorite flavor on hand. The Tic Tacs became reinforcers for behavior like strapping in by yourself or making it to the destination without kicking mommy's seat or making it to the destination without invading your sibling's personal space. You get the picture. <laughs> They're the tiniest treat, but very effective. You could certainly use them in the house too, but I just like keeping it as a special car reward. Do you see how simple it is to use add-on reinforcement in your parenting practice and how much it can help to shape your child's behavior in a positive way? Now that you know the power of add-on reinforcement, I bet you'll use it every single day with your kid. The next category of operant conditioning theory that we'll cover is in the reinforcement category still. It's takeaway reinforcement. So remember, takeaway reinforcement means removing something unpleasant to increase the likelihood of a behavior. So that is taking something away from your child that they don't like to promote better behavior. Let's run through three examples together. First, when you enter the car, you start singing the seatbelt song. And as soon as your child puts on their seatbelt, you stop singing the song. Some of my kids have gone through phases where they would get in the car and take forever to put their seatbelts on. This is after they learn how to do it on their own. One option using takeaway reinforcement is to sing the seatbelt song, which goes like this. The first thing you do when you get in the car is strap in, strap in, and you sing it from the moment you enter the car until your child straps in over and over with increasing volume if necessary. <laughs> the idea here is to remove that unpleasant song when they start showing the good behavior of strapping in to increase the likelihood of more behavior, more of that strapping in quickly in the future. If you have an amazing singing voice, the consequence may not be as effective for your kids, but my kids tend to buckle in quite quickly when I start singing. <laughs> Example two, frequent requests to put their shoes away. Okay, so if your child puts their shoes away, then they get no more nagging from mom. Do you have any kids who constantly leave their shoes out in the entryway rather than putting them away and you feel like you're constantly nagging them? Using a takeaway reinforcement strategy, you might say something like, imagine how nice it would be if you didn't have to hear me nag you about your shoes all the time because you'd already put them away. 
you help them to see that doing the good behavior of putting their shoes away removes the unpleasant nagging. When you see your child put their shoes away, you might jokingly pretend that you were about to say something and then kind of mime a zip in my lips motion to show them that you don't need to nag them anymore. And our third example is your child wants to be allowed to walk on the sidewalk without holding hands. If your child stays near you, then you let them walk big kid style. As kids get older, they don't always want to hold hands when walking on the sidewalk. You might say that they can try walking independently as long as they stay close to you. You can release their hand after they agree. Now, in this case, holding hands is actually something unpleasant, making them feel like a young child. By giving them the independence to walk alone, you're taking away something unpleasant, hand holding, to increase the likelihood of them staying near you. This works out well when they do safely stay near you because they feel mature and independent and you may be free of a situation when they were tugging on your arm to be free. <laughs> Now let's talk about choices. Providing choices is a key component of teaching consequences. Teaching consequences early, meaning as soon as they can move independently, helps children to learn to make good choices and become good listeners. It also helps you to maintain a sense of control in your parenting. The idea here is to set up a potential consequence for your child and forewarn them of exactly what behavior will lead to that consequence. So in the sidewalk example, that means clearly stating that they do not have to hold hands if they stay within arm's reach of you. But if they go farther than that, you will grab their hand again. You wanna be sure that your child fully understands the potential consequence of you grabbing their hand again before making their behavior choice. That is, how far are they gonna run from you? In this example, confirm that they understand before you let go of their hand and then decide whether they're gonna stay close or not. Of note, if you give your child the chance to walk alone and then they do not stay within arm's reach, you must follow through on the consequence of grabbing their hand again. Follow through is key to using if then statements. They can try again later or on your next outing. Providing choices and setting up consequences in this manner is really the first form of what's often referred to as positive discipline or gentle discipline. If you're interested in diving deeper into the world of positive discipline and unlocking the secrets to getting your kids to listen and respect your words, I'm excited to announce an upcoming free workshop. This event will go beyond the basics, exploring advanced strategies strategies for what to do when your child refuses to do something that you've asked of them. It's an opportunity not to be missed for anyone committed to fostering a loving, respectful, and effective parenting approach. You can register right now at www.drlindsayemerson.com respect. I'll pop that link down in the description below. Now let's move on to take away punishment. We've wrapped up both types of reinforcement, add on and take away. And now we're ready to move on to punishment as defined by Skinner's operant conditioning theory. Continuing with the take away theme, we'll begin with take away punishment, saving add on punishment for last. Now remember, punishment is a consequence that follows a behavior and aims to decrease the likelihood of that behavior occurring again in the future. The take away part means you're removing something. So in take away punishment, we are removing something pleasant to decrease the likelihood of a behavior happening again. That is taking away something your child likes to promote better behavior. Most of your interactions with your child should be neutral to positive, but there are definitely times when negative consequences are important. Research has provided a goal ratio of 80 neutral to positive interactions with your child and no more than 20 negative interactions with your child. That's a very important point. So to provide age appropriate boundaries and set up consequences for your children while maintaining a loving and friendly relationship with them, 
choose the target behaviors that matter the most to you and to their development such that no more than 20% of your interaction with, with your child throughout the day are focused on these problematic behaviors. For toddlers, I recommend takeaway punishment in the form of removal from a situation as opposed to removing a favorite toy or a privilege, which might be more appropriate for a child closer to school age years. Now let's run through four examples. First, a child repeatedly takes a toy from a friend. So you have them, take five. First, talk to your child explaining that we don't take toys away from friends and that they'll get a turn soon and that it makes their friend feel sad, angry, or frustrated. Then tell your child that if they can't wait for their turn, they'll need to step away from the play area for a short period. If the problem continues, escort the child away. You can hold up your hand and ask them to take five deep breaths to help them calm down and until they can agree to play without taking toys from others. Then they can return to the play area. Stepping away from the play area is taking away something that your child likes. So this approach is similar to a time out, but it feels much more supportive and restorative to me. Second, your child is hitting at a play date. So you leave the play date early. Actually leaving a play date would be a consequence reserved for a very extreme behavior that you really do not want repeated in the future. Now remember, these are young kids who are still learning social norms and emotion regulation, so you wouldn't want to run off at the first sign of aggression, but rather forewarn the child of the potential consequence if the behavior is repeated. Third, children are bickering in the car, so you pull the car over and step out. In this car example, you would first politely request that the children stop bickering, or you could use this for kicking the seat or whatever problem behavior you're having in the car. Then you let them know that it makes it very hard for you to drive safely with so much distraction and let them know that you'll need to pull over if they do not stop. There doesn't need to be any drama. You can take your time to pull over safely. <laughs> Usually the shock of you actually pulling over before arriving at your destination is enough to stop the problem behavior, but you can actually step out if they do not stop bickering or ask the children to step out if you're in a safe location. Typically, doing this once means that when you encounter a similar situation and you forewarn them that you'll need to pull over if they don't stop bickering, they'll stop without any further incident. Next, a child throws a tantrum at a store, so you leave the store. Leaving the grocery store is a classic example of takeaway punishment. You may be thinking that this is more of a punishment for you than your child, but some kids do enjoy the excitement of picking out items at the store or people watching. And if there's a treat at the end for good behavior that is lost by leaving early, then that is a real consequence. Again, this is one of those dramatic moves that, though done calmly, is memorable and typically does not need repetition. Usually the mere statement of leaving the grocery store is enough to stop the problem behavior, especially if you explain that it would be unfortunate to have to leave all the items that you've already picked out and inconvenience the store employees to put them back for you. Next, I'll briefly touch on four important guidelines for using takeaway punishment in your parenting practice. First, talk it through. Please remember, with any consequence, this is not a primary disciplinary technique. So talking through right and wrong, trying to get an understanding of your child's feelings, and helping them get their emotions regulated will work for most problematic behaviors. Second, forewarning is essential. Most of these issues can be resolved by talking it out and won't need consequences. If needed though, these consequences must be stated in advance, especially with young children who are so new to social and cultural expectations. We are teaching, not torturing your munchkins. After talking it out, if you feel like the consequence is warranted, whether that's the first offense, second offense, etc., you clearly state that if they do the same behavior again, then the specific consequence will happen. For example, if you hit tie again, we will have to leave the play date early and go home. Set up a reasonable and fair consequence so that you feel justified in following through on it if needed. Next, follow through is critical. You must follow through on the stated consequence. You're giving your child an opportunity to learn here. Do you want them to learn that your words are meaningful and your actions are reliable? 
And in addition to having a loving relationship with your child, you're the authority figure in the relationship. Or do you want them to learn that you make casual threats but don't follow through? So there's really no point in listening to your words. I think you know the right answer to that one. The pattern of consistently setting parameters for your children and sticking to them helps to support your children in learning right from wrong and in learning to listen to your words. When I see seven, eight, nine-year-olds who don't listen to requests from their parents, I know that consequences were not consistently used in their younger years. For example, the other day I saw a friend roughhousing with her son in a very fun and playful manner. Then she told him that she was ready to stop and that they should take a break for a few minutes while she chatted with a friend, but he wouldn't stop jumping on her. You don't want to be controlling in your relationship with your child, but you do want to feel in control and know that you're not going to get walked over, or in this case, jumped on repeatedly when you're trying to have a conversation with another adult. You do want to hold your kids accountable for their actions to help teach them self-control and responsibility. Remember to register for my free workshop at www.drlindsayemerson.com slash respect for practical strategies that will help you do just that. Next, let's talk about physically moving your child. Keep in mind that following through on consequences may mean gently, but physically moving your child's body. Whether it's helping to remove a toy from their hand that they took from another child and won't release, or removing a dangerous or a fragile object that you've asked them to put down, or moving their body away from the play group to take five, or even carrying them up to their bedroom if they refuse to head to nap time. These are not ideal situations, but are warranted as a last resort after you've tried talking it out, maybe tried humor like, oh man, you don't want to walk up on your own to nap time, what if we race instead? Present these options as a choice to give your child as much independence as possible. For example, Tanya, I told you if you hit your friend again, you would need to take five. You can walk over to that corner of the room with me now, or I can carry you over there. You choose. Now remember, we want the vast majority of our interactions with our children to be neutral to positive, but when necessary, takeaway punishment can be a powerful parenting tool. When clearly communicated in a loving way, takeaway punishment can effectively teach boundaries. Now on to add on punishment. You're doing great. You're three quarters of the way through learning how to apply this powerful tool of operant conditioning to parenting. Next in the punishment category is add on punishment. In add on punishment, we are again trying to decrease the likelihood of a behavior happening again in the future. But this time we add an unpleasant response to the behavior. So that is we add something that your child doesn't like to promote better behavior. Here are four examples of add on punishment applied to parenting young children. Number one, your child reaches for something you told them not to touch you give a disapproving look. Number two, your child hits you to get your attention and you firmly say, no, we do not hit, use gentle touch. Number three, your child walks into the street, you yell, stop. <laughs> Number four, your child says something unkind to a sibling, you have them say three kind things to them. Now that you have a better idea of what add-on punishment looks like in parenting, let's talk about whether it's a good parenting approach. For babies, toddlers, and preschoolers, a disapproving look and a corrective, no, we don't hit, use gentle touch, is usually sufficient. I occasionally use add-on punishment with my older children, but these younger kiddos just haven't developed their frontal lobes in their brain, enough for me to feel okay with using tough consequences yet. It's much better to use add-on reinforcement and when appropriate, take away reinforcement or take away punishment in general, but especially with younger children. Next, let's touch on three important considerations when using add-on punishment. First, when takeaway reinforcement turns into add-on punishment. So one of the uses of add-on punishment that might come up with your little ones would be as a consequence following the use of takeaway reinforcement. For example, following up on the example from our takeaway reinforcement discussion of your child wanting to be allowed to walk on the sidewalk without holding hands, you said to them, yes, you can walk without holding my hand as long as you stay within arm's reach. 
And if you go farther than that, I will have to hold your hand again. You confirm that they understand and agree to the parameters. Let's say they don't stay near you and you grab their hand again. Now, grabbing their hand is actually acting as add-on punishment. You're applying an unpleasant stimulus, hand-holding when they ask for independence, to decrease the likelihood of a behavior running off in a dangerous situation. Next, when it's okay to yell. Let's look at this example of yelling stop when your child walks into the street. Clearly, this is an example of when it's okay to yell at your child. You really want them to pay attention to your words for their own safety. This is also a reason why you should not regularly yell at your children. You want them to listen if you ever yell at them. Plus, it just feels awful to be yelled at, and we don't want that experience for our children. That said, I have absolutely lost my cool with my kids and raised my voice despite having the best intentions not to. In my parenting membership, we discuss two related concepts. The first is how to turn events like that into positive learning experiences for your children. And the second is lots of tips on how to control your anger for the most challenging parenting moments. Next, let's talk about physical punishment. I recommend entirely avoiding the use of physical punishment in your parenting practice. You now have some pretty powerful tools that you can use to help shape your child's behavior without resorting to actions like spanking. Also, there are significant drawbacks to the use of physical punishment. First, there's no love involved in physically hurting your child. If your goal is to balance disciplinary needs now with the friendly relationship you want to have with your children when they're adults, using physical punishment may jeopardize that future relationship. Spanking is actually one of the most researched aspects of parenting with hundreds of studies looking at the varying effects of spanking. So let's look at some of the findings. There's a type of research study called a meta-analysis that pools the results of multiple other research studies to derive conclusions about that whole body of research. So in a large 2016 meta-analysis, spanking was found to be related to more negative relationships with parents. Second, you can truly harm your child with physical punishment, as much larger and stronger adults can become very frustrated or angry with their children, it's quite possible for parents to seriously hurt their child. With the youngest children, you can see this in the case of shaken baby syndrome. Similarly, the research shows that when children are spanked, they're at greater risk for physical abuse by their parents. You may think this would never happen to you, but have you ever slammed a door harder than you intended when you were angry? It's no small feat to stay in control of your own body when your child is exhibiting their worst behavior. It can be a slippery slope once you let physical punishment into your household. Third, in addition to physical harm, there may be emotional and psychological harm involved in using physical punishment as well. That same meta-analysis found spanking to be associated with more aggression and antisocial behavior, more mental health problems, lower cognitive ability, and lower self-esteem. Now, parenting choices like whether to use physical punishment or not are complex. There can be cross-cultural and within-cultural differences. Worldwide, spanking is actually very common, and I'm here to inform you about research findings and offer my own personal opinion, but not to judge you for your choices. One more thought, though, for anyone who's still not convinced about avoiding physical punishment. It's your job to model good behavior for your children, to teach them problem-solving skills, and to help them grow up to be good people. So what is spanking teaching your children? When in the real world is it okay to hurt somebody who has offended you? How would you feel if your child's teacher called you into the office to discuss how your child has been spanking other children when they get upset? How would you feel if your child spanked your beautiful grandchildren one day? On the flip side, please do not stress if you've ever had a total fluke and are a little too rough with your child. I will freely admit that I once smacked one of my kids completely by accident. I was engaged in a conversation and felt a sharp pain on my bottom and out of instinct whipped my hand back to stop what was causing the pain. And my child somehow snuck up on me and for some reason decided to bite me on the butt and that that would be the best way to get my attention. <laughs> I was shocked that he was what I had smacked. He was totally fine, but I was quite embarrassed having to explain to the other person that I was chatting with that I don't normally hit my children. Just be aware of your conscious choice not to use physical punishment with them and do your best to stick with that. If you feel like you're not able to control your actions or your use of physical punishment may actually be physical abuse, 
please seek support right away. There's a strong intergenerational transmission effect for domestic violence, such that if you were the victim of domestic violence as a child, you are far more likely to be physically abusive with your own family as an adult. And that's a trend that victims of domestic violence should be aware of and a reminder to get help now before your children and your children's children suffer the consequences. Before we wrap up, I wanna share that operant conditioning theory is not just about changing your child's behavior, it's about transforming your entire approach to parenting to have a more clearly definable pattern. It can help parents who are feeling stuck or frustrated with their current approach to discipline. Now that you understand this theory, you'll be able to look at each parenting situation from a new angle and think, what is my response teaching my child? And how will that affect their future behavior? While all four components of operant conditioning theory serve a purpose, remember to keep your focus on your child's good behavior using add-on reinforcement, such that at least 80% of your parenting interactions are neutral or positive. Wow, if you have stuck with me this far, I am truly impressed with your thirst for knowledge and love of learning core psychology principles to guide your parenting. You may be wondering about the broader context of Skinner's theory. Operant conditioning theory is one of three fundamental theories in the field of behavioral psychology, which studies how we learn through interactions with our environment. Another behavioral psychology theory that is instrumental to effective parenting is social learning theory, and you can learn Learn more about that in my next video that I recommend on screen. Keep up the good work on your amazing parenting journey.